when it comes to the gospel, you can't be off even a little bit. Because if you are, whatever you're clinging to, whatever you're hoping in, whatever you're preaching will no longer be the gospel because remember the gospel is Jesus plus anything equals nothing and Jesus plus nothing equals everything. That's the gospel and there's no middle ground. Now Martin Luther got a hold of this and he talks about this in his commentary on Galatians. He says, there is no middle ground between Christian righteousness and works righteousness because there is no other alternative to Christian righteousness but works righteousness. Now look what he says. If you do not build your confidence on the work of Christ, you must build your confidence on your own work. He's saying there's no middle ground between the righteousness that Christ secured for you on the cross and the righteousness you might be trying hard to achieve for yourself. No middle ground. They're two very different things. You can't mix them together. You can't mix grace and law. Romans eleven six, 6, Paul says, if it's by grace, it can't be based on law keeping. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. No middle ground. You see, the gospel is about a particular order. And if you distort, or better, if you reverse the order, you take the good news out of the gospel. You destroy it. Here's what I mean by reversing the order. Think about these two questions. Do we do the best we can to be good and do good and then God accepts us? Or does God accept us by faith in Christ and then we seek to live for him? Which is it? Do I obey God and then God accepts me? Or does God accept me and then I obey God? It's one or the other. It's it's, it's, it's not both and. It's one or the other. There's no middle ground. And Paul says, he says, as soon as you modify it, Modify the gospel by trying to find some middle ground. It's not the gospel anymore. Now, let me give you a couple of examples how churches modify the gospel and end up way off course. And this happens in so-called liberal churches, and it happens in so-called conservative churches, only in different ways. In the more liberal churches, here's what they would say. They would say, oh, great. You, You say you've been born again through faith in Christ. That's great. There's just one little thing. One little thing you need to adjust, uh, modify. One little thing to keep in mind. Just don't go around saying that good people in other religions or good people with no religion, for that matter, can't get to God unless they come to God through Christ. It's okay for you to say that you've received Christ and now you have this personal relationship with God, but don't, don't say that other people outside the faith have to come to God through Jesus. Don't say that good people of other religions are good people with no religion Don't say that they're not saved. That's all, just that one little thing, just that one little thing. Okay, is that one little thing? What are they they saying? They're they're saying, uh, okay, you had a nice experience with Jesus, but the fact of the matter is being good is enough. Good people in other religions, good people with no religion, that's what matters, being good. But that teaching completely changes everything because, you see, the systems of this world say the good people are in and the bad people are out. That's the number one religious belief in the world today. But think about this. When Jesus tells the parable of his wedding banquet in Matthew 22, it's going to blow your mind. Don't tell me that all religions are the same. When Jesus tells the parable of the wedding banquet in Matthew 22, he tells a story about a father who's giving a wedding feast for his son. Kind of obvious who he's talking about, right? But this father is giving a wedding banquet for his son. He sends out invitations, and a lot of folks RSVP, no thank you. No thank you. They refuse the invitation. So he sends his servants out into the highways and byways, and they invite all kinds of people to come. And when they accept the father's invitation, they're given a wedding garment to wear. And as long as you're wearing the wedding garment, you're in. So who ends up coming? This is amazing. I can't imagine any other founder of any other religion saying anything like this. Who comes to the wedding feast? Look at it on the screen, Matthew twenty two ten. 10. And those servants went out to the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. Bad and good? Good. 
Do you say, you see, when people say what really matters is being good no matter what you believe, I want to say there's only one problem. What about all us bad people? And they laugh and say, oh, come on, you're a preacher. And I say, well, hold on, you don't know my heart. You don't know what I'm capable of. How dare you take away my, the hope that I have in Christ and tell me to put my hope in my own goodness? I mean, you say being good is good enough, but how good is good enough? Listen, I know I'd never make it on my own. I can never earn or deserve God's favor because of my goodness. If that's the measure, I won't make it. Jesus plus my goodness equals salvation? No, no. By saying, yes, I believe in Jesus, that's wonderful. But the main thing, the most important thing is being a good person, that reverses the order of the gospel. And if you add one thing to the gospel, Jesus plus try hard to be a good person, try hard to be a good Christian. Listen, that one modification changes everything. It totally reverses everything. And Paul says that gospel is no gospel at all because it's not good news anymore because it always leaves you wondering, am I good enough? But as odd as this may sound, the reversal is not all that different in what we would call conservative or evangelical churches. And I'm not just, I'm not talking about Fundamentalist churches that add a list of rules to faith that you have to obey in order to have God love you and accept you and that kind of thing. I'm talking about scores of conservative evangelical churches, churches like this one. Now, I'm gonna quote from a book that I read in seminary in a class that I took on the spiritual life. The book is called The Dynamics of Spiritual Life by a man named Richard Lovelace. And it's a long academic book. And to be honest, when I read it in seminary, I, it didn't sink in because, primarily because I didn't see it applying to me or the church I attended. But this is what Lovelace says about conservative evangelical churches and Christians like us. First of all, he explains two important doctrines of the Christian faith, two doctrines related to the gospel, justification and sanctification. Now stay with me. He doesn't talk like I talk. In the New Testament, justification, the acceptance of believers as righteous in the sight of God through the righteousness of Christ accounted to them, and sanctification, progress in actual holiness expressed in their lives are often closely intertwined as if these two concepts were identical when in reality, they are quite distinct, okay? Two doctrines, did you get it? Justification is God's acceptance of us based on our faith in the work of Christ. Sanctification is our progress in holiness, our progress in growing to become more and more like Christ. And Loveless says they are related, but they're not the same. They're not identical, and we end up confusing them. Now, what he goes on to say is that the gospel, the core truth of the gospel, is about the order of these two important doctrines. That's why Paul talks about reversing the gospel. It's about the order. It's cause and effect. It's about what comes first and what follows. And he's saying, if you get the order wrong, if you modify the gospel by reversing cause and effect, you lose everything, you got nothing. And what Paul is saying is here is because you are justified, that's the ground, that's the basis of your sanctification. Meaning, because God has accepted you, because of the work Jesus did for you on the cross, because of his death and resurrection, because he has sent his spirit to live inside of you, because of his work done on your behalf, then that you live in light of that amazing grace truth. That's the gospel. Not you live a certain way in order to be accepted. No, because of what God has done for you in Christ and by his indwelling spirit, you are enabled to live a different way. The gospel is because of, not in order to. 
Justification leads to sanctification, or another way to put it is your sanctification is the result of your justification. But according to Lovelace, that's not the way it works in many evangelical churches at all. He says in their daily lives, many evangelical Christians rely on their sanctification for their justification. They reverse the, lo- the order and they end up judging their justification by how well they're doing in their sanctification. In other words, they judge whether they are saved or not by how they have behaved. Now stay with me, this is so critical. He says, only a fraction of professing Christians are solidly appropriating the justifying work of Christ in their life. In their day-to-day lives, they rely on their sanctification for their justification, listen, drawing their assurance of acceptance with God from their sincerity, their past experience of conversion, their recent religious performance, or the relative infrequency of their disobedience. He goes on to say, Christians who are no longer sure that God loves them and accepts them in Jesus, apart from their spiritual achievements, are subconsciously, radically insecure people because of the constant bulletins they receive from their Christian environment about the holiness of God and the righteousness that they're supposed to have. And their insecurity shows itself in pride a fierce defensive assertion of their own righteousness and defensive criticism of others. They cling desperately to legal, pharisaical righteousness, but envy, jealousy, and all other branches of the tree of sin grow out of their fundamental insecurity. Powerful stuff. I mean, I had to read this like six times in order to get it. So you, let me boil it down. You go into liberal churches, you don't see changed lives. You see people living like everybody else. You see people living like hobbits in total ignorance of that trouble is coming with a capital T. They're told, oh yeah, God loves you in some vague general way, but there's no electrifying passion for the love of God that comes from the knowledge that although we are under the judgment of God, look at what Jesus has done to rescue us and save us and set us free. There's none of that. So you don't see changed lives. But sadly, when you go into evangelical churches, you don't see much life change either. Why not? Mostly because of a steady stream of teaching and preaching that beats people over the heads with how they're not measuring up to some list of rules that some preacher uses to measure whether you're a Christian or not. And what you end up with are Christians who try to live the Christian life, try to live up to rules and principles they are given out of guilt-motivated willpower. Oh, I don't cuss anymore. I, I have a quiet time. I read my Bible. I go to church on Sunday. I tithe because, you know, <laughs> if I don't tithe, God will get my money some, some other way, right? I, I dress differently. I don't hang out with bad people. I mean, I'm a good Christian, right? Not necessarily. That's not the kind of life the gospel calls us to, a life of trying harder to do better. And here's what happens. Here's what happens. We know we should be honest. We know we should be unselfish. We know we should be loving. We know we should love our neighbor more than we love ourselves. We know that we shouldn't watch certain things on TV or on our computers. We know there's lots of things that we should be doing We know there's lots of things that we shouldn't be doing, and when we fall short, when we mess up, the bulletin of our conscience or the devil's accusations, what do they say? They say, you call yourself a Christian and you do that? And depending on what church you attend, there's a steady stream of preaching that tells you to judge whether or not you're saved because of how you have behaved. And there's no lasting life change. But what you end up with is beaten down, guilt-ridden Christians who struggle with the assurance of their salvation because they know they fall short. Or you end up with legalistic, pharisaical, self-righteous Christians who think they do measure up and they're always ready to tell you when you don't. And you don't really see changed lives in conservative churches either, what you see are chained lives, not changed lives. 
We're not truly free in Christ the way Paul talks about freedom in Christ later on in this book. We'll get to it. We're still living as slaves to rules and the anxiety and guilt that comes from not living up to rules. And even worse, the pride and self-righteousness that comes when we think we do measure up. You see in this, it's a reversal. Instead of sanctification being the result of justification, it's justification based on sanctification. It's judging your justification based on how well you're doing in your sanctification. It's judging whether or not you're a Christian based on how good you are. And again, that's why so many preachers beat you to death by telling you, if, and if you don't measure up, you're probably never saved to start with. Now, under that kind of preaching, listen, the real issue is if people were never really saved to start with, it's probably because they never heard the gospel. They heard what you need to do is commit yourself to Christ. And an unbeliever hears that as, I got to try harder to live like church people live. Should we be committed? Absolutely. But is commitment, being committed to Christ, is that the invitation? No, no. If people have never really been saved to start with, you shouldn't tell those kinds of people to try harder to live better. You should take them back to the cross and say, let me introduce you to Jesus. I don't know what you heard, but you didn't hear what Jesus has done for you and how good it is. You're in trouble with a capital T and only he can save you and make you right with God and keep you right with God. That's what they need to hear. Because you see, the gospel is because I'm totally accepted by God, based on what Jesus has done for me, out of gratitude, I wanna become like him. It is most definitely not. I'm trying hard to clean up my life. I'm trying hard to follow the rules so that God will love me and accept me and be happy with me. And sadly, a lot of folks come to Christ thinking that is the invitation, and it's not. So are there people who think they're Christians and they're not? Absolutely, but it's because they don't understand or they never understood what the gospel was to begin with. Listen, it's not, this is not a minor thing. This is not semantics. It's the difference between heaven and hell for an unbeliever and for a Christian, it's the difference between slavery and freedom. It's the difference between gratefulness and joy versus fear and guilt. It's the difference between a changing life and a chained life. Because when you modify the gospel, when you reverse the order, you're never quite sure if you're measuring up. You're never quite sure if you're good enough. Like if you think repentance saves you, you're never quite sure if you repented enough or felt sorry enough. If you think it's your commitment to Christ that makes you saved and keeps you saved, you're never quite sure if you're committed enough or surrendered enough. You never know. And if you struggle with the assurance of your salvation, it's because you're judging whether you're saved or not by your works, not Christ's work. It's because you've mixed justification and sanctification. It's because you've distorted the gospel of the grace of God and you've mixed in trying harder to do better. Like, this is why it's so critically important to be clear on the gospel because to modify the gospel at all is to lose it entirely. To add to the finished work of Christ in any way is to undermine the gospel because any change, any reversal of the order means you lose the gospel of God, of God, of Christ. That's the second point Paul makes here in verses 11 and 12. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me to you is not man's gospel, for I didn't receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Why is being clear on the gospel so very important? Number two, because the gospel came directly from Jesus himself. Look, in this passage, Paul makes some very harsh statements. In this sermon, I've made some very hard statements. But it's not because, it, it, it's, it's not about what Paul says. It's not about what Charlie Boyd or Jason or Jim say. It's about what Jesus says. 
It's about the gospel that Paul received directly from Jesus himself, and it's about the gospel that you and I have received from Paul in Holy Spirit-inspired scripture. And Paul, what he's saying is we have to be clear on what the gospel is and what the gospel is not, because first of all, if, if you distort it, you destroy it. And second, it's the truth that came from Jesus himself. You see, the gospel is not Jesus plus obeying the Mosaic law. The gospel is not Jesus plus living according to his teaching. The gospel is not Jesus plus trying, to, trying harder to do better. The gospel is not Jesus plus a set of doctrines. The gospel is not Jesus plus water baptism. The gospel is not Jesus plus baptism in the Holy Spirit. The gospel is not Jesus plus speaking in tongues. The gospel is not Jesus plus church membership. The gospel is not Jesus plus committing your life to Christ. The gospel is not Jesus plus living your best life now. The gospel is not Jesus plus anything. No matter how good or helpful that is, is that anything might be Jesus plus anything equals nothing. The gospel is the good news of God's grace. It's all about, it's 100% about what God has done for us in Christ, not what we do for God to be good and, and, to, and, and to do good. The gospel is about Christ's righteousness being given to you as a gift of grace that comes through faith it is not about works to achieve a righteousness on our own. You can't mix the two. There's no in between. There's no middle ground. There's no both and. One comes before the other. It's the other. One leads to the other. It's cause and effect. One more time, the gospel is, verse four, Jesus died for my sins to rescue me from this present evil age and from the judgment of God that's coming into the world he died to save us and rescue us from the trouble that's coming to us with a capital T. And God raised him from the dead so his promise of eternal abundant life can be ours right here, right now. But the gospel is because of, not in order to. Remember the parable that I, I mentioned earlier uh, you know, like, and I asked the question, how can good and bad people be welcomed into the son's wedding feast? Here's how. First, only because they have accepted the Father's gracious invitation to come celebrate the Son. And when you accept the invitation, you're giving a wedding garment. Now, you know what that is. It's the very righteousness of Christ himself, gifted to us by God. You only have to say, Yes, to the invitation to come to Jesus, you only have to say, Jesus, I trust you to give me the forgiveness and life that I could never earn or deserve on my own. And when you do that, you're given the righteousness of Christ, his goodness, and I think he is good enough. His goodness becomes your goodness, and that's how God sees you. And when you do put your faith and trust in Christ, you receive the gift of Christ's righteousness, you receive the gift of the indwelling spirit of Christ who lives in you to live Jesus' life through you and only through the spirit's power, not willpower, will there be real life change. That's the gospel. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. 